Hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our latest edition and closing out the year Disco Live. It's so great to see everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hannah Olson. My pronouns are she, her, and I would be described as a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a gray Disclo hat, and currently my background's quite complex, but I'm sitting in a, a living room with a big plant behind me. Um, really excited for today's session. Thank you, Joshua, um, for putting this together. We saw 2023 was was really a crazy year in the HR space, and I, I think we admittedly all are, are feeling that. And what we've seen is ADA-related lawsuits, particularly discrimination lawsuits, increased by about 77% uh, from last year, which for us really signaled a big shift in the workplace and, and dynamics of that. And so today we're going to try to dive into as many of these trends as possible. We're going to touch upon the rise in accommodation requests, the growing need for support for mental illness and mental health at work, and then also going into this new generation of employees, the Gen Zs, um, and their different, um, differing health, health needs in the workplace. And so I think a lot of companies have been unprepared and it's not a bad thing. We understand uh, we've got a lot on our plate um, and they weren't prepared for these challenges and these changes. And so today we're going to hopefully show you how to navigate this new landscape and really try to create and shape not only a supportive workplace, but a compliant one, which of course is important as well. I just want to note today's session is not at all legal advice. Um, Joshua nor I are a uh, licensed attorney, but so if you do have questions that are um, anything legal, we we recommend that you actually go in and speak to your counsel and or some kind of licensed attorney. Um, we're going to talk today as well. We're going to have a, a time for a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll be trying to parse through some of them during the session, but we'll make sure to leave time at the end as well. Um, last thing to note is that today's session is going to be recorded and it will be available to replay soon. All of our webinars are available at disclo.com slash backslash webinars. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I first wanted to introduce myself a little bit more and then introduce my colleague Joshua as well. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannah Olson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Disclo. Got into this work uh, many years ago. Disability. This is actually our second company in the disability space. I. This work is deeply personal to me. Uh, I'm someone who has a chronic health condition that at times was disabling. I had a permanent IV known as a pick line in my arm for about two and a half years when I was first entering the workplace, and and really struggled navigating that um, experience and those conversations with my employer. And long story, long story short, ended up leaving my job and joined a startup. And it was in that office that I wanted people like me with chronic illnesses and disabilities to be able to find work and to be able to find that purpose and meaning and work at inclusive companies that really care and value the strength of people with disabilities. And so we started our first business, Chronically Capable, back in 2018, really serving as a job platform for chronically ill and disabled professionals. And then from that, during the pandemic, we started to hear about this increasing challenge around the ADA and accommodations. And so that sparked the, the need and uh, business of, of around Disclo, which we're here speaking on today. And just want to say that we're super excited to be joined as well, or I'm super excited to be joined as well by Joshua Peterson. Joshua is my colleague, and I'll let him introduce himself, uh, Himself, but really, really impressive background. We're so lucky to have this, uh, Joshua as our in-house expert at Disclo. Um, so without further ado, I'd lo love to introduce you, Joshua. Great. Thanks, Hannah. And I, I feel very fortunate and blessed to be at Disclo and providing the service and just part of the wonderful team we have here. So Joshua Peterson, uh, he, him, I would be described as a white male um, wearing currently a kind of a maroon, uh, you know, polo three button shirt. My background is I'm in a home office. I've got family pictures and all kinds of things around me. Um, I have over 25 years of uh, HR program management experience starting in health and welfare, pension, 401k benefits, uh, outsourced experience, and then moving in-house into uh, working for, you see company logos there, doing benefits program uh, management and implementation, and then into leaf management. And uh, the last many, many years in accommodations, reassignment and disability management. And so it's been great to then uh, now bring that experience and uh, match it, uh, my passion for, for that area with the passion of Disclo, Kai and Hannah and the whole team and really now build out a platform that is just state-of-the-art and really um, 
forward leaning in uh, helping companies stay compliant and managing their accommodations while giving employees an amazing experience. So I'm uh, just so super thrilled to be here uh, with the whole team. Uh, so that will we'll get on going forward. And um, as we've been sharing, and I saw there's already a, a question of this uh, in the comments. So today's uh, session uh, will be uh, eligible for HR uh, certification um, credits. Uh, Disco has recently become an approved provider with the HR Certification Institute, which really validates uh, the educational value of our events. So today's webinar specifically is eligible for 0.75 credit hours toward the HR IC's eight credentials, which you see listed on the screen. Um, we are curious how many people are joining today that will be getting recertification credits. Would you just type a quick yes in the comments? And real quick, you see emoji reactions across the bottom of LinkedIn. Hannah and I cannot see that. We're broadcasting from a, a kind of a studio software, but we can see your comments. So type yes there, please, in the comment if you're get, getting HRCI certification. We like to count those and uh, see really the impact that we're able to give. Um, and uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll move on forward. So um, the first portion of our session is going to cover some ADA background. Uh, some of you may not be very, or may already be very familiar with this information. Uh, and it's really important uh, that we have a foundation laid, especially for those who are, are kind of on different learning journeys. We are so glad to have allies across all the spectrum of learning, experience, and um, influence and impact. And so we, we're going to spend a couple of minutes going over some of that foundational information so that we're all kind of caught up to the same space. Hannah? Yeah, great. Thank you, Joshua. Um, again, just to, to re reiterate, some of this may be, uh, you may already be very familiar with, but... So just to kind of give the, the background on disability and how the ADA defines disability, it's actually, believe it or not, more misunderstood than, than many think. And there's really kind of three key aspects to the definition of disability. And, and first, it has to be a disability can be physical or a mental impairment that's actually substantially limiting one or more major life activities. This could be things like thinking or interacting with others. The second part of that definition is that it inc also includes people who have a history of such impairment. So someone like myself who may not active, actively be experiencing those symptoms, but I do have that history. And then lastly, it also covers those who are perceived as having an impairment, regardless of whether or not they actually do or have a formal diagnosis. And so because this definition is so broad, um, it was designed that way for a reason. It can also include things like mental health conditions, um, which we all are aware of are rising exponentially. And right now they're really helping or really um, impacting people's ability to, to work. And so this is really important when we think about this definition, because we want to understand that disability doesn't look one way and it's, it's a lot broader and can and be applied to a lot more people than, than we think. Um, next slide, please. So given that many of you are already in this room or in this virtual room are people leaders, you probably already understand the ADA and um, know that what it really exists to do is to ensure non-discrimination against people with disabilities in all areas of employment. And so this can include hiring, promotion, and also in the termination process, um, the least favorite part of, of folks' roles. Um, and employers are also required to actually provide accommodations to all employees with disabilities. And this can also, again, include mental health conditions, um, unless it's actually causing significant difficulty or expense to the employer. So not all accommodations are reasonable. And oftentimes they actually get a negative stereotype. Um, I, you know, we have these conversations with HR leaders all the time and we hear this idea that accommodations are expensive or they're difficult for us to make. But in reality, they are really minimal and fruitful investments as the Job Accommodation Network always lovely set, says so lovely. Um, and they, they shouldn't have this negative stereotype because they're really helping to enable the employee to perform their job. Um, they're not special treatment. They're not benefits. Um, and, and so under the ADA, individuals with disabilities, and that again includes mental health conditions, um, they're supposed to be able to have these protections uh, for a reason. And so on the next slide, if you don't mind, Joshua, um, just want to talk through that accommodations, again, they're not a one size fits all um, solution. Not, accommodate, not all accommodations look the same for everyone, and they really should be determined on an individual basis through what's known as an interactive process. And we'll get deeper into the interactive process a little later in the session, but I just want to call attention to some of the common requests that we see at, at Disclo. We see things such as flexible scheduling, modified breaks, 
ability to work from home, very, very common right now with return to office. And again, what we're really trying to debunk here is this misconception that accommodations are expensive and that they're difficult to implement. Because again, in reality, they're, they're not that difficult. They're very minimal. Um, and in fact, most accommodations are free to make. Job Accommodation Network, I quote them quite frequently, but they have a recent survey that actually says that most accommodations cost just $300 or less. So again, we're not talking about very, very expensive changes here. Um, I'll kick it off to you, Joshua. Excellent. Thanks. Continuing on with our uh, kind of laying the groundwork here. So, so now where things are, you know, kind of get pretty sticky is determining what is a reasonable request. So, you know, unlike FMLA or most leave of absences, which kind of have some pretty straightforward uh, guardrails on what's allowed and what you're eligible or you're not, certain number of hours for qualifications, um, accommodations could be much more gray and nebulous. And uh, so an accommodation is considered you know, reasonable under the ADA if it is effective in enabling the employee with a disability to perform their job uh, without causing an undue hardship to the employer. So that's a total mouthful. Um, and if you have that memorized, you know, down pat, then I applaud you. Um, it took me years to be able to say that from memory. Um, but, you know, it, the, the one real important part is that it has to, you know, address a specific need of the individual. So this could be something like, you know, modifying a work schedule or adjusting a job task. <clears throat> and the key here is finding a balance that supports the employee's needs while also being feasible uh, or reasonable for the business operations. So most of our employer clients um, find that um, many accommodations are simply just practical solutions oftentimes. So yet the reality is that not all requests are going to be reasonable. So we uh, won't today be going in depth into what constitutes unreasonable or an undue hardship. However, we wanna point to you, <clears throat> excuse me, to a previous webinar uh, that we've done titled the Un Understanding the Rights and Responsibilities of Employers and Employees in, in the ADA Accommodations Process. You can find that on our webinar page at disco.com slash webinars. Uh, today, we're gonna uh, kind of steer clear. That's a whole entire conversation and at least half a webinar just talking about what is undue hardship. So um, ADA lawsuits have really, really spiked in 2023. Uh, that's where we want to spend the bulk of our conversation today is to talk about that surge in disability discrimination charges that have been filed against employers by their employees. Um, so if you've missed the headlines, um, here's a couple on the screen that you can read. Um, my colleagues at Disclo and myself, we've been closely tracking this space for quite a while, and we kind of predicted the surge to occur uh, just because of all the changes you know that covid brought and uh, many other things uh, covid really thrust accommodations awareness really up to the top uh, and now more employees are just more educated regarding their rights under the ada so um, employers you know aren't uh, necessarily always the best prepared to handle this increase um, and um, in a you know real we'll say compliant uh, as well as employee centric way and because of that, uh, employees have felt discriminated against. So in the past year alone, uh, disability has remained the number one cause of discrimination lawsuits in the EEOC. Uh, and that has spiked 77% from 2022 uh, 20 to 2023. The large majority of these cases were filed uh, in the EEOC's fourth quarter, which is our regular third quarter. And one thing we want to note here is that uh, most of the lawsuits that are being publicized today actually started years ago. And we're hearing from the folks we know at the EEOC that they're really inundated with ADA cases right now. Um, so it's taking longer to respond. That kind of means that the cycle, the wave of, uh, of, of lawsuits are just now being publicized. So it's likely that the increase is actually more than 77%. That's just the one that they've been able to get through on their backlog at this point. So um, back to you, Hannah. Yeah, thank you for, for that background. Um, and so we want to kind of dig deeper into what's fueling this surge. We're seeing these headlines, we're thinking about this, and we feel like most companies have kind of put ADA on the back burner. You know, I said that we tend to not prioritize it as much, but now, you know, as we just mentioned, there's this heightened attention. And so let's talk through a few of the causes. Um, we could probably list out 10 or so reasons um, why there's an uptick, but I'm just going to focus on a few today. Um, we are in this total pressure cooker um, right now. And Joshua, if you don't mind switching to the next slide for me here, um, but we're in this pressure cooker right now. And so we want to focus on these three 
main trends. First being the return to office and really the increase overall in requests, which again can be attributed to a lot of different things, but more requests equals more opportunities for an employee to be dissatisfied and us as employers um, to not properly handle this. Um, second is the really the growing need of mental health support at work. This is a very hot topic right now, um, and it's becoming, as we know, mental health is really a critical focus in the workplace. Um, but are we thinking about this in the terms of accommodations? Can accommodations be part of that mental health discussion? And then lastly, um, the third factor that we're seeing is the influence of Gen Z on the workplace. The values and the needs of Gen Z employees, they're really kind of reshaping workplace health policies and forcing employers to kind of rethink inclusion and, and start thinking about things in a, a different way. And so next slide. Awesome. Um, so I know many of you are, are likely fully remote, um, but if you're, I would love to do a pulse check in the audience if possible uh, to see how many companies represented today are back in the office or if, if you're back in the office, but doing a hybrid schedule, would love to hear that, see that as well. Um, so in the comments, if you could type a one, if you're still fully re remote, a two, if you're hybrid, and maybe a three, if you're fully in the office. Um, so love to, to see those answers there. Again, one being fully remote, two being hybrid, and three being um, fully back in the office. Yeah, I know those responses are coming in. And we'll just say also, as we're going through the presentation today, if you have any comments, like yep, I agree, or you disagree and have uh, some feedback on maybe a point we're making or some other stat that you're aware of, uh, or any questions that you'd like us to answer when we break for Q&A, please add those as we go along. We'd love to have discussion going. Awesome. Awesome. I'm seeing some of these come in. So it's looking like we're having a mix of a lot of hybrid is what we're I'm yep. seeing. Some back in the office fully, but definitely a lot of, of hybrid as well. Um, so there's obviously been a lot of challenges with this return to office RTO um, and these different policies that are, are now being rolled out. And there's been really an unexpected impact on ADA lawsuits. So as companies are starting to transition back to the office, we're starting to see correlated with that a significant uptick in claims. And many of these claims are actually focused on workplace and commute related anxiety, um, as well as PTSD. And so this trend is starting to become really a major contributor to this new surge. And it spotlights to us the need for not only adaptive return to office strategies, but also empathetic and thinking back around just responding with empathy and, and how do we treat our, our people with care. And we've seen, you know, in particular, there's this heightened concern from employees and a lot of folks who may be at risk. Uh, they might be with health risk or with disabilities. They're requesting accommodations because they're trying to help, help to mitigate these risks associated with COVID exposure. You know, as someone who's immunocompromised myself, I know I'm in a, in a remote work environment, but if I were going back to office, I'd have definitely a sense of, of anxiety around that, just given the fact that I have this, this extra risk. And so after we've adopted to remote work, many of employees are starting to want to maintain that work-life balance that they had during COVID um, while they were working from home. And so with this kind of increased recognition and also openness around mental health, again, including anxiety around these challenges that COVID brought, um, this is leading to, to more requests. And so that leads me to my next point, which is that mental health, as many of us know, has really reached a tipping point. And employees today are in need of more support than I think we've ever seen before. And Joshua, if you don't mind, there we are. Um, so companies need to be aware of this because the EEOC is really caring a lot about mental health, and they've been very vocal about that as well and that increased focus. So they released their strategic plan, which many of you probably have read. Um, and this plan, which is through 2028, it's emphasizing mental health related disabilities, which currently we're accounting for about 15% of recent disability claims. Um, and this is when the report was written, so I can imagine um, that's gone even further. But you know, I don't think we need to go too deep into what mental illness is as a whole, but um, Really, you know, just as diabetes is a disorder of our pancreas, mental illnesses are mental health conditions. They are medical conditions, um, and they often can result in diminished capacity for coping um, and being able to cope with just the ordinary demands of life, and that includes work. And so we're seeing that increased focus where employees are facing challenges when it comes to actually maintaining good mental health at work. And so Next slide, please. Um, some of these kind of common challenges that we're seeing is there's this first being the high workload and job demands, 
when we have excessive workloads and kind of these unrealistic expectations, um, oftentimes there's this pressure and that employees feel that we have to meet these deadlines. Um, we have to, you know, do everything perfectly all the time. And this can really contribute to an increase in mental health issues at work. And employees are feeling overwhelmed and work might add and just contribute to this kind of stress and anxiety. And importantly, another trend we see there is, is burnout. And next is kind of, we're seeing this kind of lack of control over our work tasks um, and decision-making. When people feel like they have little control over things, um, they might starting to feel frustrated or disengaged at work, which is obviously a, a big challenge. Um, then we're seeing poor work-life balance especially with us going back to the office, we're commuting, people are realizing we're spending a lot of time, you know, in traffic going to work and that ability to have a, a balance and, and have time for ourselves, um, it's it's hard. And, and people feel this, again, stress and they feel like they're not able to have both a personal life and a, a work life. Then we're seeing conflicts with supervisors and coworkers, interpersonal relationships, do obviously have, there are bad times and we do have conflicts and this can kind of create a, a stressful work environment for people. Um, so people who have those kind of interactions quite regularly do see often more stress and, and feel more anxiety around this. Caregiving responsibilities is another one. You know, we, we see a lot of working parents um, or people who are caregiving responsibilities just outside of their job. Um, they struggle to balance. And it's this, you know, how do I strike this balance between doing what I have to do during the day from nine to five, but then also that five to nine, which we, we hear a lot about. Um, and then lastly is the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course just really further exasperated mental health issues at work, remote work and social isolation, all of these things um, contributed to higher stress levels. And we know that COVID changed a lot of us um, and trying to get back to normal after that has, has been difficult for, for many. Joshua, I'll kick it back to you on, on how we can actually support employees through these times. Yeah, for sure. So uh, employers have, you know, an essential role in, that they play in promoting the mental health and well-being of their, of their workplace. Uh, creating a supportive work environment is crucial for promoting mental health. Uh, so I'd say for employer representatives on, on today, if you've not taken a lot of time to really think about your supportive work environment and you're seeing a lot of increased claims in promoting in, in mental health area, please see that direct correlation is essential for you to really drill into with your HR leaders, employee relations, and maybe even get some roundtables going inside with some, with some employees and get some feedback there because that could really make a marked difference inside of your company. Um, so a, a lot of employees just, they, they don't feel engaged uh, and they're lacking in productivity. So it can also reduce uh, the risk of burnout and absenteeism by having that supportive work environment. Also open communication about mental health issues is an important first step in helping to reduce the stigma and fostering a more understanding work environment. So employers can encourage employees to speak openly about their mental health concerns, uh, and they can provide resources to support them in, uh, in addressing uh, the concerns as well. Um, so, of course, some employees may require an accommodation, which we'll focus on in a bit. Uh, but not all employees who have a mental health condition will require accommodations. But what's important is for those that do, that the accommodation should be individualized and developed with the input of the employee. Um, some examples of accommodations you know, for mental health conditions that are common would be flexible schedule arrangements, um, schedule adjustments. So maybe they they typically start at nine. Maybe they can start a little at eleven and you know bump their work a little bit later if that works. Uh, you know for their for their type of work, um, a positive you know reinforcement and flexible uh, supervision. Uh, just to name a few. So beyond all the legal things that you know we must do, uh, the good ideas that you can do at the end of the day is to remember the importance of empathy. So when you handle an employee that's going through an accommodation and especially one uh, that has a mental health condition uh, related, um, really, really use a lot of empathy. Um, it's going to go a long, long way because asking for accommodations is usually, you know, getting to that point is exhausting and it can be a difficult decision to make that request. So we always remind our employer partners to respond and operate with empathy. Um, you know, next is a little more about the influence of uh, Gen Z in the workplace. So, you know, return to uh, office and mental health uh, illness, um, obviously, you know, pretty hot, hot topics within HR. Um, and I think we've got what we can all agree here. 
Um, the third challenge that we've highlighted is one that um, is just, I think, starting to be seen and felt over the last several years as Gen Z is becoming more and more a part of the, the, uh, the workforce uh, today. Um, so related to the, you know, th this point here, um, it, it has uh, partly to do with the, uh, the mental health crisis. Um, so the, this generation is just more likely to experience anxiety and depression. Um, and this is uh, part due to social media, part due to the political unrest and part gun violence and lots of other you know, contributing factors. Um, but adding to this generation's rising mental health challenges, uh, Gen Z was more likely to have received accommodations in high school and at college than previous generations. And so now they're graduating and, and guess what? They understand accommodations. They understand um, the requirement to be flexible and to consider requests. So they're seeking accommodations at work. Um, so these, uh, you know, kind of quote, modern employees are more open, they're more likely to dis disclose their disabilities than previous generations, and just kind of talk about personal things at work where previous generations were less comfortable, uh, or it's just kind of a rule that you didn't. Um, so while the open openness is, you know, admirable, and it also means that as a company, we have to be prepared to handle these disclosures appropriately. Um, and we have uh, to offer a supportive environment where employees feel safe to disclose their needs. So impact here. Um, so while these trends are uh, affecting companies of all sizes, um, we have witnessed a lot of people leaders at startups feeling really um, just kind of invincible. Um, we work predominantly with high growth, progressive, forward thinking companies who wanna be inclusive and build a great uh, culture at their workplace. Um, but, you know, uh, many of the people leaders that we speak to um, have failed to prioritize disability inclusion, and it's uh, been on the back burner. And so, you know, we, we get it. Um, as a small business, you know, there's so many people fires you're putting out, and this might feel like something that only affects really big companies. Uh, we also hear a lot of, uh, you know, well, you know, hey, we're an inclusive company, you know, so our people feel safe, and they, they just ask for whatever they need. We don't really need a process because our culture is just really, really good. Um, unfortunately, this is not a good way to be thinking about this. It's a common misconception that large employment lawsuits only happen to large employers. It's not the case. And if you scan headlines, you'll see this. So um, on this slide here, uh, you know, you'll see a headline from a, a recent EEO, EEOC press release about a local Atlanta doctor's office with about 30 employees. Uh, that just got charged uh, by the EEOC uh, for discrimination. The cost of litigation could put the small companies out of business, given that the average cost of a settlement, this is without it going to full uh, lawsuit in court, but a settlement is around 200000 So uh, as we go into this final section, we're going to talk through some strategies that employers uh, can use for handling the ADA surge. And our hope is that you'll uh, realize this does apply to you, regardless of the size of your company, and it's never too early or too late to take this seriously. Anna? I apologize. This is uh, also still me. Um, so, uh, so there's a you know been an influx in in, in a request you know kind of across the board, um, and uh, if you're not seeing them yet, then uh, then you know you you will be seeing them. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about best practice for handling these requests uh, so that you're well prepared. So uh, first off is that um, everyone should feel like they have a solid understanding of the laws and protections that exist. This includes the ADA, the Pump Act, and the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Um, we obviously have spent the first portion of this conversation talking about this, um, but it's important that you really spend the time to familiarize yourself, uh, your HR, your employee relations, your managers, uh, with the ADA, and particularly it, its definition of a disability, reasonable accommodation, and undue hardship, and how those might apply to your specific company. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, to stay updated on any uh, charges and updates, EOC filings, things like that. Um, I personally think that the uh, next protection we're going to see uh, is for caregivers, uh, given that there's so much pressure, that sandwich generation, you're caring for usually an older adult uh, family member as well as you know someone a younger uh, like a child and uh, of your own um, next is to create a clear policy around accommodations and disability inclusion um, once we know all the legalese um, we next need to have a clear 
and documented process for accommodation requests. Uh, this should include steps for your employee to follow, uh, who they should contact, and the documentation required. Uh, we hear a lot of anecdotes from employees who don't even know how to ask for an accommodation. Um, so the lack of insight into the process adds to the fear and discomfort uh, that employees feel around disclosing and wondering if their company, their employer, their manager is really going to treat them fairly. So we're happy to share an example policy uh, like you see on the slide. If you contact uh, Disclo, either Hannah or I through uh, LinkedIn, you can also now uh, you can uh, contact uh, company pages on LinkedIn. So you can go to the Disclo page and contact us there if you'd like to uh, get an example policy. Um, so this is something that uh, we see many companies missing. And what ends up happening is an employee goes to their manager, the manager goes to HR, and suddenly the whole thing is just really awkward and more people than the you know, employee ever wanted to know, uh, know about their situation. So uh, being real clear and having a process outlined uh, and communicated to your uh, employees is really, really important. So next is to uh, make everyone feel safe. Um, so we know the law, uh, you've got a process out there documented, and now we want people to really uh, feel safe in requesting support. So this isn't an overnight thing. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, it's gonna take some process and some commitment from your company. But we wanna make sure that you are fostering a work environment where employees feel comfortable speaking up uh, uh, about their uh, need for an accommodation. A few tactics that uh, we've seen work well are having a company all, all hands or lunch and learns where disability is just destigmatized. Also, when leaders speak up about their own experiences, it really makes a difference. Um, so I always wish, uh, you know, I had seen leadership um, in the companies that I've worked, worked for talking about their own personal disabilities, their own medical conditions, or that uh, in their family and how they've experienced, uh, experienced those and, uh, and worked through them. I think that would help a lot of employees uh, to come forward. Anna? I, I totally agree on that as well. And I, I think, you know, just to, to speak on, on top of that, you know, in my own personal experience, I just rare, rarely ever saw leaders talking on LinkedIn, you know, getting into this space back in 2018. We just weren't seeing people talking about their disabilities and they weren't being vocal about it. So how is someone with a disability, are you going to feel comfortable talking about it and asking for support if we're not even seeing that from the top down? And so I think, you know, we're starting to see more of this. And, you know, of course, it's a very personal decision to make. But if you are a leader and you feel comfortable talking about it, it can really help someone else feel safe. And so just want to make sure that we we talk through that as well. Um, and so earlier, you know, I talked about the interactive process just quite briefly, but um, I like to just call this the back and forth conversation that you have with an employee. Um, but the EEOC has said time and time again that when a case hits their desk, uh, the first thing that they're evaluating is, did this company engage in a true interactive process? They're going to be making sure that you had an open dialogue and that you were really trying to understand that the specific needs of that employee and that you really did go above and beyond to explore various options with them. And really the goal of an interactive process is to try to find an effective solution. And the purpose, again, of an accommodation is really that the employee is better able to perform their role or to perform at the same ability, ability as one someone without a disability. And so the reason that we call this the interactive process is because it should be interactive um, and it should, should not be just us telling an employee yes or no, um, or here's what we think is going to work for you. It's individualized and it is interactive. And so... I just said that this should be individualized. Um, and we just wanna make sure again that accommodations are not this one size fits all approach. We really can't make assumptions and generalizations because people with disabilities might be completely, or might be impacted um, just very differently. And, and not all accommodations work for all people. You know, as someone with Lyme disease, I know for me an accommodation was not being able to lift um, things over like 15 pounds. But for someone else with Lyme disease, it might be more cognitive. It might affect them uh, more on the cognitive side. And so they might be saying, I need more extended time or I need written instructions. And so it can look very different. And we want to make sure that we're evaluating each request individually and in the context of that person's role and their specific needs. Joshua?
I think you're muted, Joshua. Sorry. That's just technology. Awful. Thank you. Oh man, uh, multitasking. So um, we we uh, as we're talking through strategies to your company can do and implement. Um, we cannot, you know, stress uh, enough just how important it is to respect an employee's privacy. Uh, we can do this by keeping, you know, their medical information and specifics about their accommodation request confidential. Uh, oftentimes, employees divulge information that is irrelevant to the decision being made, uh, and that can be really, really personal information, the diagnosis, uh, details, history that isn't necessary, but it's there. And it's yours. It's in your, you know, in your lap, in your hand, on your screen, and you've got to do the right thing with it, and make sure that you uh, keep that private and confidential. And uh, with that, don't ever store medical records uh, in your HRIS. Uh, accom accommodation requests and anything regarding, you know, medical information is to be stored separately from any uh, personnel, employee personnel files, so that it's never uh, misconstrued that you, you know, use that information in employment decisions. And anyone who has access to that personal file or that part of the HRIS doesn't see that who should. Um, so please, uh, please always keep that in mind. Uh, next is uh, we always encourage to be flexible and open minded minded. So kind of holistically, we should be willing to consider various accommodation options. Uh, try to be flexible because sometimes they're very simple adjustments to make. And um, sometimes it can make a huge difference to the employee's, uh, you know, day to day life. Um, and I just want to make one note real quick, you know, a lot of times you see in an accommodation process, um, the initial thing that an, that an employee uh, requests, the company thinks, oh, that's an undue hardship or that's unreasonable. And so they say no, and then they just want to move on and kind of forget about it. You, if you go look or you start seeing the, a lot of the EEOC uh, lawsuits are being filed or employee, you know, makes a claim, EEOC looks at it and then, you know, goes to the, um, the employer is because simply the employer failed to engage in the, in the interactive process. They just took initial requests, said, hey, we can't do this. No, kind of go away, fired them, said, hey, you, got, you can't do your job anymore. And the employee, you know, filed. And, and one, the interactive process is saying, hey, you know, this is difficult and let's talk about some other options. So open-minded, flexible, consider all options that are available before you start making a decision of, or what, of what might be uh, unreasonable. Um, next, in, uh, important is always to document. HR folks know you document, document, document. If, it, if it's not documented, it's going to be hard to prove that it actually happened. So you make sure that you keep detailed records of this request, the interactive process, decisions made, conversations, who is in conversations, when they happened. Uh, this documentation will be very important, not only for legal compliance, but also for future reference. In similar situations, when you're considering, hey, what's our precedence? So uh, definitely do that. Uh, next is to monitor and adjust. So sometimes, uh, you know, something that we see a lot uh, with employers is uh, they'll engage in the interactive process, they'll implement an accommodation, and then they'll think, okay, you know, we're done, kind of one and done. But your duty is to support um, the employee all the way through the life cycle. So your support does not stop once the accommodation is provided. Uh, make sure you do regular check-ins with your employee. We say, I like to say one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and then at least every three to six months after. So there are regular uh, checkpoints where they can give you feedback. You're saying, hey, employee, just wanna make sure this accommodation is still effective in meeting your needs. Hey, manager, is this still effective in, in enabling this employee to do the full essential functions of their jobs? And then use that. Uh, this is a great opportunity to show your employee that you genuinely care about their success uh, and their well-being. Uh, back to you, Hannah. Now I'm the one who's who's not uh, muted. Sorry about sorry about that. Um, I think lastly, just to to kick it off or to end this here is when in doubt, it's okay to ask for help. Um, hopefully, some of your questions might have been answered today. Um, but is it is okay to seek outside support? Time and time again, we'll hear companies just trying to figure it out. Uh, but the ADA is very very complicated law, and it's very very different than leave and FMLA. It's very murky. It's very gray. So when in doubt. Don't risk it um, and, and do ask for support, either whether that be from an attorney or um, an outside solution. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, companies do have a legal and ethical responsibility to really try to provide a safe and a healthy work environment for all of their people. 
Um, and when we actually go out and support folks and give them access to accommodations, we're always going to see a benefit. No one rarely, rarely says that an accommodation was harmful to them. It's a win-win because when people get the support they need, they're better able to perform in their job. They're happier in their role. Uh, they're getting the help that they need. And so they're oftentimes more loyal, more productive, um, and they just generally have a better view of the company that they're working at. And they feel, you know, my company is supporting me and enabling me to do my best work. And so while it all might feel overwhelming and there's just a lot that we have to do, um, at the end of the day, I really hope all of us can see the benefits of building an inclusive and accepting workplace and really start to realize that at the end of the day, this is about helping people and it helps all with that. And so, you know, with that, I'd love to kick it off to the Q&A portion. Um, for the HRCI certification holders who are joining us today, we are gonna be sharing the activity ID in the webinar comments. So you'll either enter the ID in your HRCI account, um, and that's where you'll be able to get the 0.75 hours of recertification credit. So we're super excited to be offering um, these credits in our future webinars. So definitely keep coming um, so you can get all of those hours completed. So we'll kick it to the Q&A, Joshua. Yeah, so we have a question or two. So um, if you, yeah, HRCI, that the activity ID should be shared here in just a moment in the comments also. Uh, we have a feedback uh, form that we've created. We uh, There's the, the activity uh, feedback form that uh, link that'll be coming in. We love detailed feedback around, you know, did you find this material today effective, uh, relevant to, you know, your job duty? How is Hannah and I's communication? What are some future ideas you would like for Disco to cover um, in this area? We'd love some feedback to help form some future webinars. Um, so right now, uh, we did have a question that came in. Uh, that was um, from Stephanie on LinkedIn. Any suggestions for getting uh, that sort of participation from folks who feel uh, like uh, that's you know personal and not appropriate for for work discussion? Um, let's yeah. see. I have. I have. Yeah. A go ahead, Anna. To kick it off. I think you know. First off, is just creating the space. Uh, where people can feel safe to have these conversations. I think we see these isolated events where a company might have a lunch and learn session. And it's great because we start talking about this topic and making it more normal, but it always stops there. People are only given the opportunity to disclose typically at the interview stage. And up after that, the employee has to come to their manager or if they're lucky HR and go through that process. Um, and so if we can create more opportunities and more moments in time where we're just creating the space, I think that's one big piece there. Um, the other thing I, I, I think as well is just showing your commitment as a company and making it known that if you ask for support or if you disclose, you're not, your job's not at risk, your ability to move up in that role and really showing your commitment because a lot of the fear comes from this idea of if I say something, I might lose my job, I might not get that promotion I'm up for things are going to look different for me. And so if we can really foster, you know, foster that commitment and, and show it to, to our employees, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable having those conversations. I don't know if there's anything Absolutely. you want to add here. Yeah, for sure. And actually, uh, Stephanie just uh, did a clarifying comment to say that was regarding sharing disability stories. So mm -hmm. that was just sharing disability stories for, for leaders. So I think, think that's what you meant. Maybe you say a yes or no. Um, so, uh, for getting leaders to share disability stories is just simply to, to, to say, um, and, and, you know, we, we, we see this a lot cause obviously we're in this area, but when you go to a lot of companies, DEI uh, pages, you look at their goals, you'll see, you know, a lot of protected classes mentioned there. So yeah, leaders in particular, Stephanie said, so you see, you know, the, the, the protected classes that should be there, um, that, um, that they're, you know, growing their stats in or hiring in or leadership growth, but disability is often not included or kind of way, way at the bottom, but for the most part, not included. So I think the first part is if you're an HR leader, ER leader, and you're trying to kind of bring that awareness is to get leadership to really see the value in talking specifically about disability inclusion, along with all the other, your other inclusion metrics and, and classes that you're, you know, increasing representation in and such. So then that leadership kind of starts to talk about that, you know, from the top, and uh, you want to talk about then kind of destigmatizing that um, disability is something that you should be ashamed of um, and, and that it's rather it's just it's a part of a person. It's a part of their identity. It's something that they cannot change about themselves. And so it's something we want to 
welcome them to bring their full selves to work. Uh, and so asking, you know, are there any stories from our leaders um, who, who would like to just share that, you know, they're, they have a, a disability. Hopefully they have to feel good, I think, comfortable from their leadership, uh, you know, peers that they're not going to uh, start get kind of, you know, get discriminated against or, or felt of differently. But the fact that they've, they've reached a leadership uh, role, that there's potential for those with disabilities uh, to say, hey, come to our company. Uh, we are a company who, in, you know, who, uh, who gives opportunity to all people, regardless of race, religion, you know, gender, identity, and disability, you know, all the classes together. I am a leader who has reached the you know, C-suite at our company, and I have a disability that I struggle with, have to tend to every day. I have to take time off for every once in a while, whatever that is. They don't have to you know, disclose exactly what it is if they're not comfortable, but just kind of that thing of like, there is potential here. You can come here and we're gonna give opportunity. If you, you know, will apply yourselves, you, you, disability is not gonna be a, a blocker or a barrier for you at Blank Company. Hopefully that helps. Uh, and then let's see, there are a couple of comments. Um, Karen on LinkedIn says, as HR leaders, we need to ensure our managers and even ourselves don't let personal biases interfere with decisions around what is or isn't considered to be a reasonable accommodation. 100%, like five-star comment, uh, Karen. We have to take ourselves and our own experiences out of this. This is really about you have an employee who is having um, you know, some interference in their work due to their disability. They want to perform. How do you give them some adjustment that enables them to perform the essential functions of their role uh, and keeps your, you know, the, them being productive in their job? So it is uh, taking yourself out of it is 100 percent right. And just having that discussion. Um, and then uh, Paul shared something that is a great reminder. Small companies can apply for a special grant to use the money uh, toward accommodations or also accessibility um changes or adjustments uh, at their company like installing a ramp things like that modifications you can find that um i believe on the eoc's website they're looking for um, like accessibility or accommodation reimbursement um and let's see any, i'm going to check one more time for any questions drop any more questions comments or thoughts uh in the comments and we are just over 45 minutes so if there's no more comments, we'll keep it tight. So great. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's been a really great experience this year um, doing these LinkedIn Lives uh, for Disclo and uh, with Hannah and the team. And so we're excited to continue this on at the new year. So please click on that feedback form. Give us some ideas for webinars you'd like to see. Give us some feedback um, on this content. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you in the new year and beyond. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you in 2024. Thank you. Awesome. Take care.